believe the psalmist to have said it best when discussing the love of God. In Psalms, the 36th chapter, beginning around verse 7, the psalmist brings up the question, or rather makes the proclamation of how excellent the love of God is. He says, How excellent is thy love and kindness, O God, therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Uh, the the idea of mentioned throughout the Psalms in multiple places, like here in Psalms 36, once again in the 50s, and once again in the 70s and the 90s, multiple times throughout all of the Psalms, the psalmist makes mentions about how we as mankind should put our hope and our strength and our rest in the shadow of God's wings. And here he brings out an excellent point as he says, How excellent is thy love, O God! Therefore, because of it, or therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. We're going to look at three points this afternoon. We're going to look at God's love. We're going to look, number one, at his described love. Number two, his demonstrated love. And number three, his demanding love. A lot of points to look at. And why bring us another sermon on the love of God? It is a concept, friends, that we need not to forget, and I believe it to be one that we, I don't know if we'll ever be able to fully comprehend or understand. Uh, Paul makes mention there in Romans, the fifth chapter, he says, God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. If you recall there in John, the third chapter, verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, John 14, 15. He later goes on in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, and the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Whenever we look at the love that was shown, the love that was given through the sacrifice of Christ and demonstrated in that sacrifice, and because of that sacrifice, it demands something for us. The love of God is very essential in the life and the mind of Christians. So we're going to discuss it this afternoon. Arguably the most efficient and familiar verse when discussing the love of God, or rather maybe even one of the more popular verses, right, would be John 3, it's 16. Uh, where the Bible states that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What better place to go than the verse that says how much God loved us and what he done for us, right? I'm looking at John chapter 3, verse 16. Don't misunderstand John 3 at 16 either. It was not due to the sacrifice that God was able to develop a love for us. That wasn't it. It was due to God's love, the sacrifice came for us through Jesus Christ. God loved us so much, he wanted to offer salvation. Peter later confirms this in 2 Peter 3 at verse 9. Four things this verse shows if you're taking notes. Remember, we're looking at God's described love from John 3 at verse 16. And it shows us four, at least four things, arguably seven. But we'll just do four this afternoon. Number one, it shows how incredible the love is. Notice who it came from. We see the source of love. Oftentimes when we as humans try to demonstrate love today, we demonstrate it the best way or the most expensive way sometimes that we can. And we think, well, that does it best, right? Sometimes the source is the most important thing. Who it came from does not necessarily make it any better or what it is does not make it any better or worse than more so who it came from. Understanding who gave it to me and the reason that individual or that thing, that person gave it to me is really the significance behind it all. Why did God give Christ? The Bible says because he loved you. And that means a lot. And whenever I see the things that I've done and I, in the general aspect of the world there in John 1, I rejected the Christ. I put him on the cross. I had him to be crucified. I was his creation and turned him away. But God said, I loved you and I sent him for you. That's where we see the source, right? 1 John 4, verse 8, the Bible says, The love that is so incredible is known where? It's known in God. Uh, he that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? Because God is what? God is the source. God is love. 
So whenever I look at the truest form of love ever shown, and that will ever be shown, that will never be surpassed, is what? The love God's shown us and how it's incredible. Number two, it is immeasurable. How much do you love me? Well, let me get my wallet real quick. Uh, I love you five dollars worth right now. Uh, maybe catch me next week. It might be double. Who knows? Right? That, that, that's oftentimes how we measure love. Well, how much did Kevin love me? Well, on my last birthday, he didn't get me nothing. So he better double up this year. Right? That, that's how we measure it. How much did the in-laws love me? Well, at Christmas, they took care of me. They helped me with this. The in-laws liked me. All right? I'll tell you what. They liked me. I, I put a number on it sometimes. No. That's not how love used to be. And whenever we look at the love of God, to be able to put a, if you will, price tag on it, how valuable was the life of Christ? Can you put a number on it? Can you say it's worth this much or what you would give for it again? No, we can't do that. It's impossible. Psalms 103, beginning at verse 11 and going through verse 12, the psalmist says, For as the heavens is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. How far is east from west? How, how far is north from south? There's, there's the link. There's the measurement of the love of God. To which there is no meaning. You keep traveling west to try to get east, and what happens? You're still going west. There's, there's, the, there's the measurability of the love of God. It's impossible. There is no distance. There is no amount. There is no limitations on it. The psalmist said it best here. And, and to prove it, he says the transgressions that we had against him, that's how far he's removed them from us. You know, I've talked to a lot of people that's been married many years uh, for advice, you know, wisdom. You know, how, how, to, how, to, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? Well, how did you do this? This, that, and the other. And then I asked them, you know, if your significant other was to pass away, you know, what would you do? And they said, I'd just keep on going. There's nothing I can't do. Can't replace them. Now, my grandma and grandpa, they give a joke towards each other. Hey, as soon as you're gone, I'm getting in up. All right? I mean, they'll go back and forth, and as a joking matter, but at the end of the day, there, there's not another one for them. They'll tell you that. Number three, the love of God is irreplaceable. You know, with, with mankind and its misconstructed idea of what love is, oftentimes if one love goes, we can bring another one into its place. Or I used to have a love for baseball, now I've replaced it with a love of golf or ping pong or some other sport or some other hobby, right? Uh, and once I lose love or interest in that, I'll bring in something else. Well, whenever looking at the idea of the love of God, it's irreplaceable. Hebrews writer says, Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 5, for as Christians today, our conversation, it needs to be without covetousness and be content with the things that you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Who can take the place of God in our lives? Who's, who can give us the love that God gave us the way he done it and is sufficient to do what it said it would do? Who can do it better? Nobody. It's irreplaceable. Number four. This is one of my favorite ones. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 46. You ever seen love break? Absolutely, right? I, I, I've sat through marriage counseling with individuals. I've tried to help people in certain scenarios. And one of the most heartbreaking things they'll ever say is, I just don't love the person anymore. There is no longer love there. It breaks your heart. Love is, is not a concept. Love is not something that comes and goes. If love is there, it stays. If it is true love, as we see that with God. But whenever we bring into this man-made idea of, well, I love it is temporary or my love is conditional, that's not how it is with God. Uh, we, we see conditions to receive his love. We see conditions to stay in his love. But God sent his son for whom? For everyone. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. So whenever I look at love, love is indestructible. Or at least it should be. 
that concept in today's society with marriages, friendships, etc. Guess what? It's no longer carried as it was, but it should be. Psalms 46, beginning at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though the waters therefore roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Verse 5, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her from that right early. God's there. Not going anywhere. He's certainly not going to be swayed, pushed aside, or destroyed due to anything this world can throw at him or our relationship with him. Friends, if we truly love God, there's nothing that's going to separate us from that love. Nothing can besides ourselves. That's how John describes the love, right? John 3, 16. Let's look at how the love was demonstrated. We know it was demonstrated or shown or example was given of it by the life Christ lived and the sacrifice he gave. Romans 5, and verse 8. This is number 2. God's demonstrated love. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us or Christ died for the ungodly. <clears throat> Call at times the great revealing passage of love of the Bible. Now that we have the love that's been described, the Bible reveals to us, though it has in times, times before, both old and new, here, especially in Romans 5, Paul takes the opportunity inspired by God or the Holy Spirit to what? To reveal what the love done and who it was for. This verse validates the love God has for us. If we needed that verse, here it is. Validation. What, what's another word for validation in your mind? I think of proof. I don't know about you, but proof. Uh, almost a, a type of stamp of approval. This shows me that this is credible. This is the credible, the viable, the validating verse, if you will, of God's love and what it does. Number four things about this love. If you notice, I, I've kept the alliteration for those of you that, that, that really enjoy that. The first one was all eyes, right? Love was incredible, immeasurable, irreplaceable, indestructible. Guess what? These loves are going to be the four pieces. Love is passionate. The love that God extends towards us as Christians, as well as the opportunity of it towards the whole world, has passion with it. It has meaning. It has, if you will, almost a, a sense of depth. Ze Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning at verse 17. Zephaniah 3 at 17. The Bible says, The Lord thy God... Is in the midst of the uh, in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save thee. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Answer the question: Does God care about you loving Him and serving Him? I can show in instances where mankind didn't do that and it bothered God. So one can take off a, a very well educated. You know, gathering of information that if it bothered God when we didn't do it, it pleases Him when we do do it. Right? We see in our early days in Genesis 6, mankind did not serve God. Their, their imaginations of their heart was evil continually. And what did it do to God? It repented God that He had made man. It upset God. It bothered Him. Well, whenever I take that and I apply it to the positive, man's obedient, man's faithful, as Christ was, God said He was well pleased. We see it's passionate. We see he's there. He's always there. If you recall the nation of Israel, throughout their, you know, indifference with God at times, and their back and forth <laughs> say, Saul, we're with him, we're not, we're with him, we're not. What do we see God? He was a constant, was he not? He was there. He always promised through the promise of Abraham a remnant would be brought forth. Blessings of nations would come from his seed. God was there and he showed it in love. You know what else love is? And this is one, if I can talk real quick, separate, this is one I, I, I struggle with. Love is patient. You ever thought about the patience of God? If I could just have a percentage of it, I'd be, I'd be a much better father. I'd be a much better husband. I'd probably be a much better preacher with that percentage of patience. That I, just a little bit. If he's got 100, just give me like two. Because I'm, I'm at like negative four right now. And that would that bring me up a little bit. But love is patient. It just think separate and apart from spirituality. But in your physical loving relationships that you've had with your spouses and significant others. How much patience did you have to have at times? 
I wish, oh, I wish Abby wasn't at work. I wish she could attest to this. She got to have a lot of patience still with me. And then add a three-year-old on top of it. Whew. Man, bless her heart. Pray for her if you will. Because she, she's got it rough at times. Got to have patience, right? I, 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 I'm so thankful for my mother and my grand, grandmother. The patience they had to have with me raising me. I, if, if I can, share a quick story. Whenever I was between the ages of two and five, I was really sick a lot. My grandma, how patient and loving she was, instead of sleeping in bed, she would hold me in a wooden rocking chair and rock me because that was the only way I could breathe and sleep. Because I was so just sick and sinuses and congested. I mean, just awful. And she'd hold me every night. She was patient. I'd have hung me up by my toes and went on to bed. But she was patient. Think about God. How many times, don't, not out loud, but just think, how many times have you messed up in your relationship with God? How many times has God always been there? What does he say in 2 Peter 3, verse 9? The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is what? Long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God cares. He's patient. But, though we say patience is a virtue, which it is, patience has its limitations. I can only be patient for so long. When, when is God's patience going to run out? You recall, you, know, you, you look at Nadab and Abihu, patience of God ran out. You, you, you look at Ananias and Sapphira, you, you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, when, when's next? Who, who, who's the next one? When is the patience of God, the long suffering, if you will, mentioned in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, when is it going to come to an end and judgment going to be executed? James would tell us we don't know. We best stay in the love. Number three, love is, at least from God, it's perfect. And when, when looking at it in a marital status, uh, love in the idea of perfection, the marriage is not perfect, but with each other, what is it? It is the other sense. It is complete. And the Christian, with the love of God, is what? They are complete. If you look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says that there is no fear in love, but perfect. Love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Inside of the love of God comes this idea of perfection or, excuse me, completeness. And it removes that fear because we realize and we see the relationship we have with our God. Number four, we've seen love is passionate, it is patient, it is perfect. The thing about God's love, it is persistent. You ever, you ever notice a child kind of falls into this category with their persistent love or their need for a love or attention? You know, you're trying to get something done and you got the infant reaching up wanting what? Wanting loves. Wanting, want, just want you to hold them. Want you to carry them around. Probably want some chips or some drink or something, something, something. They want something, don't they? And I'm not, I'm not nagging. I'm not aggravated. But I'm saying as the child longs for that attention and that love, God wants his love to be extended to us and for us to come into it. It is persistent. What, is, what does Jeremiah the prophet say in Jeremiah 31 and verse 3? From God, he says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. It is always there. And whenever we look at the concept of the love of God, what's fascinating to, to me, Lee, as a preacher, is we show the love was extended. We show who it's extended for. We can see how to get it. And then we say, well, eventually it runs out, right? Not the case. This love is what's going to be one of the things carrying us into eternity. And whenever we have eternal life with God, it is because he, what? Because he loves us. Oh, man. The concept and, and the idea of the love of God goes far beyond what we can imagine and takes us much better places. Number three, what have we looked at so far? We're looking at God's love. We've looked at the described love, the demonstrated love. You know, love demands something. In a marriage, what does love demand? Or maybe another word would be require. Some say the, this the false concept of 50-50, right? Each gives 50-50 to -50 make it 100. That's not how it works. If I only give half of what I can give to my marriage and the other person only gives half, what do we got? We got half a marriage. 
That's exactly what we got. But if I'm giving my all and my spouse is giving my all, what do we have? We have an all marriage. We have a complete marriage. And in my relationship with God, it demands that I give my what? Four words starts with an L. My life. How much of it? All of it. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Now the what? Now the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Love is demanding. It requires something. If you want to be in the love of God, if you want the love of God to help take you into eternity, you have to give it something. Four things. <coughs> love demands display. What does that mean? You ever seen something on display? I know you have. It means it's up there. You can see it. You can visually see it. If we say we have the love of God, what did he say to those in John 13, verse 35? By this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. The display of love towards the brethren, Galatians 6 to 2, and towards the world in evangelism, Matthew 28, proves that not only do we care about souls, but that we love God enough to keep his word, John 14, 15. It demands it. Can I be pleasing to God if I do not show Christian love? True or false? No, you cannot be pleasing to God if you don't show it. Hebrews 13, verse 1 says, for what? For brotherly love to continue. Number two, love demands. Now, the, I couldn't alliterate these. Love demands holiness. If you want to be holy for God, you must what? Give holy to God. Does that make sense? I want to be H-O-L-Y in front of God, so I have to give W-H-O-L-L-Y. If I want to be considered righteous in the eyes of God, I have to give my all to him. Love demands it. First John 2 and verse 5. But whosoever keepeth his word in him. What's the next word? Go there. First John 2 verse 5. Turn over there in your Bibles and read it with me. In that individual that keeps the word of God, it says, Verily in him is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that are in him. For those of you that have been married longer than I've been alive, did it take a little bit of perfecting? I, I, I don't know why I'm looking at Todd. He's not much older than me. I, I know he ain't been married that long. But it, no matter what the marriage is, no matter how long, or no matter how long the marriage is, it takes some. I like the word fine tuning. We gotta work out the, the wrinkles, right? And if you look at me, at least with my laundry, I'm not the best at that sometimes, don't judge me. But inside of a relationship, working out those wrinkles is required. Why? I want the relationship with my wife or with my friends to be at its best at all times. God deserves absolutely nothing less. Whenever I'm looking at the love and the, the demanding of the holiness, Friends, it has to be perfected. What does that mean, preacher? I'm failing in my evangelism. Work on it. I, I, I'm failing in my studies. Work on it. Why? Because in the individual that loves God, the love becomes perfected. You work on it. But when we move on, love demands number three, submission. You have to be submissive. You have to be willing to, to surrender all. As the hymn says, turn with me. And I know we haven't been doing a lot of turning, but we've talked about a lot of scripture. Uh, to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Uh, excuse me. Right, notice, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loves us, even when, we, even when we were dead in sin, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. Well, that doesn't show submission, does it? Hmm. Well, let's look at it one more time. God who is rich in mercy, for the great love that he's loved us with, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ. Let's back up to verse 1. You hath he quickened, 
who were dead in their trespasses and sins. Notice what we were doing before the salvation came. We were walking according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, among whom, verse 3, all we all had our conversation in times past with lust of the flesh, fulfilling those desires, and in the mind were by practice or nature the children of wrath. But we were in all of those things. But what did we have? We had a God that loved us who brought salvation for us. And even when we were dead in sins, he has made us alive or offered the possibility of being alive together with Christ by grace, are you say. Well, how do I obtain salvation? It's through the love of God. It's through obedience of his word. Number four, when looking at what God's love demands, it demands display, it demands holiness, submission. Last one, bet you can't guess it. It demands confidence one you, you rarely think of but if I were to ask you who's the love of your life and you've been married to them for 50, 60 years how confident would you be in your answer so talk you don't right brother, brother Aiden no doubt brother Gene absolutely Eugene absolutely no, no doubt no question in your mind whenever we're talking about our spouse we know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Separate and apart from your spouse, who do you love with everything that you have? God. How confident are you in that? See, I know in my relationship with my wife, she's all I want, she's all I got, all I need. Absolutely. I'm confident in that. But inside of my relationship with God, guess what? He's all I want, he's all I need, he's all I'm ever going to want, all I'm ever going to need. I'm confident in it. With the idea of confidence comes this idea of one word, loyalty, faithfulness. Right? What does God say? I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. For true love to be demonstrated inside of a physical marriage, you know what has to be shown? True love. Faithfulness, confidence, submission, holiness. It must be displayed. It has to be shown, right? We, we move on and we say, well, it, you have to be persistent with it. You have to perfect it. you got to be patient with one another. you got to show passion. You have to realize that that love you have with that individual is indestructible. Nothing should separate you. They are irreplaceable. The love you have for them cannot be measured. And that person is, in one word, simply incredible. Lesson from my wife, Todd. Get some brownie points, right? At the end of the day, just as I regard her so highly, guess what? All of that describes my relationship with my God. One word to summarize it He is incredible. He is irreplaceable. He is immeasurable. He is patient. He is perfect. He is everything. And for me, you know what He asked me to do? Show it. Perfect it, be submissive, and be confident. Notice Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. What does Paul say? Uh, why not go to Paul? We, we pretty much dealt with Paul and inspiration all evening, so why not finish with him? Romans chapter 8 and verse 38. Notice the confidence of Paul. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does he say? He is confident that this is exactly what it says to be. That's love. It's God's love. Though it was a quick summation at times in this lesson and a, a, an overview, there's verses upon verses for every point that we discuss, showing time and time again throughout history across uh, you know two, three thousand years, right? And we, we look at all this and we say, "Wow!" It's the time frame is much bigger than that, of course. But we look at it and we say, "Man, God loves His creation." And what does he ask in return, friends? He asks for obedience or love in return. How do I love God today? Well, I love him by keeping his commandments. I love him by taking his word 
and applying it to my life and becoming the best possible Christian that I can be. It all starts with becoming a Christian first. Creating that inseparable bond between God and myself. And I do that through His plan of salvation. The, the access of love, if you will, is available and only available through this process. And you have to hear, believe, repent, confess. You must be baptized. Immerse the rise to walk in the newness of life. Your sins forgiven, remembered no more. And you walk with God faithful in the day. What if I sin, as many do, Romans 3, verse 23, and I fall short of the glory of God. Remember 2 Peter 3, verse 9, how God is patient. He is long-suffering. He doesn't want you to perish, but He wants you to come to repentance. As we have opportunity, as we have right now, if you need to make things right between you and God, if in a public manner, come forward publicly and let us handle it and help you with it. Maybe it's in a private manner, and you need to take care of it right now. As we get ready to stand up and sing, don't leave this building in a wrong relationship with God. Whatever we can do for you, we want to help you in any way that we can. Please come now, together, stand as we sing. Why do you wait?